<laughs> hey guys, okay, so last time we talked about how imperialism affected China, so this time we're going to talk about Japan. We'll do a little bit of a review from some stuff from Unit 6, uh, but let's go to get started. Okay, so Western imperialism in Japan is going to really dramatically change Japan. So just to review a little bit of the history, Japan was divided by these different clans, and again, it was really split up, wasn't very unified, and it borrowed a lot of ideas like from China, like Buddhism, you had emperors, you had different f styles of writing, and then architecture, all very similar to China. And if you guys remember, we had that feudal system we talked about where you had the emperor at the top, but they didn't really have any power, very symbolic, kind of like the Queen of England. Um, and then the shogun's the one who really had all of the power. Then below that, you had the daimyo, and the daimyo were these pretty much like lords. You had the samurai, very similar to a knight. And then at the bottom, peasants, artisans, and merchants. Okay, so make sure you guys remember that. Um, so, if, also if you guys remember, um, they had this shogun that was pretty much in charge. These shoguns were these military dictators, and they're going to lead through out most of this time. You had that guy named Tokugawa Yesu. He's going to start to unify Japan, uh, and he's going to create this strong line of succession known as the Tokugawa Shogunate, and that's going to be that 200-year period of isolation that we talked about. So all of this is going to start when these different European merchants and missionaries started to arrive in Japan. And while the shogun enjoyed trading with the Europeans, that rapid conversion of Japan to Christianity, where these missionaries are coming in and saying, we just are here to convert you, is going to really worry Tokugawa Yesu. And that's what's going to lead him to ban Christianity in 1619, and then later end up banning all foreign merchants and missionaries, and pretty much completely close off Japan to the rest of the world, and create that closed country policy in that era of isolation. It's going to last for about 200 years. So again, we've talked about all of that stuff. Um, and during that era of isolation, the Japanese allowed this one port at Nagasaki Bay to remain open, but it was pretty much only Dutch and Chinese merchants. So for the most part, these people were very, very isolated. And it's going to really preserve the Japanese culture, but at the same time, it's going to put it really behind technologically. So while they were trading with that one area with the Dutch, they also learned about these new different Western ideas. And these different Dutch studies are going to help Japan learn about some of the new scientific and industrial technologies in Europe. So it's not like they're completely in the dark. They had a tiny little bit of information they'd get from the Dutch, but it still just wasn't that much. And for the most part, it's going to be isolated, while the rest of Asia is going to become more and more imperialized by Western Europe, like how it was with China in that last video. So in the early 1800s, Britain, France, Russia, and the U.S. are really going to try to negotiate trade rights in Japan. But as they continue to do this, Japan still is just like, no, we don't want to end up like China where you've taken us, gotten us addicted to drugs, and we're all split up in our own little thing. We are going to just stay ourselves, Japan, and we're not getting involved in any of y'all's drama. Okay? Um, and that's going to be good and well all the way until 1853 when you have that U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry I mentioned last time. No, not the guy from Friends. Uh, the guy from, from the U.S. who's going to eventually reopen trade with Japan. Make sure you get that Matthew Perry correct. Uh, so this Matthew Perry, though, he arrives in Tokyo with these four really strong steamships, which are going to really amaze the Japanese. They're like, steamship? What? We don't even know what that is. We know what a sail ship is. What? It's powered by steam? How does that happen? Because, again, they don't have that technology. Um, but when Matthew Perry comes, he doesn't just do this nicely. He literally shows up with his big steamship, and he demands that the Japanese trade with the U.S., um, so these officials are going to realize very quickly, they're like, oh crap, we don't got a steamship. We got like our cutesy little sail ship over here. Uh, so they're going to very quickly realize that they are definitely overmatched by the U.S. naval ships. And so when Matthew Perry says, okay, I'm going to come back, I'm going to let y'all think about it. He's going to come back the next year. And these people are like, okay, maybe we should sign it. We are definitely not going to be able to win if they go to war with us. So the Japanese officials are going to sign this treaty known as the Treaty of Kanagawa. It's going to open some of the ports to the Americans and they're going to say, ah, fine, we give up. We've tried, we've been our own thing for 200 years, but we've gonna, we're going to have to reopen our ports. Otherwise, the Americans are going to go to war with us and they're probably going to win. So we're backed into a corner and we're going to reopen tree, trade. So after the United States is going to open that trade with Japan in 1854, a lot of other Western powers are going to say, oh, the U.S. was able to open trade. We're going to try it too. So by 1860, you're going to have England... France, the Dutch, Russia, and the U.S. all have these really unequal trade treaties and extraterritorial rights that they're going to start to create in Japan. So, just like in the rest of the world with Japan, with with the, with Japan, they're going to very quickly start to conquer and take over this area. So, Western Europe. This is probably one of the worst time periods in history for Western Europe. That idea that they're literally running out of places to colonize and conquer to take over for their own advantage. 
So they take over Asia and Africa. And it just continues on with Japan. So Japan, after it decides to reopen trade and it starts to get conquered, they have this time period known as the Meiji Restoration. So the Japanese were really angry that the Shogun just gave up and gave away all of their territory to the rest of Western Europe. And they feared that Japan would become as just as powerless and end up just much, as much of a problem state as China was. So by 1867, the Tokugawa Shogun is going to actually step down and say, you know what, I gave up my power, everyone hates me now, I might as well just step down. And it's going to end that 600 years of military dictatorship where the Shogun is in charge. So now that class system we looked at, that Japanese feudalism, it is gone. And instead of a shogun, now all of a sudden that emperor that's been quiet all of these years is going to step up. So the emperor at the time was Mushido, and he's going to end up taking control of the government and took on the title of Meiji, or enlightened one. So now the emperor all of a sudden is this enlightened one. It's very simple, similar to when we talked about like that divine right of kings or the mandate of heaven, where they believe they had the God-given right to rule. Well, now the Meiji says... I have this enlightened sense that I am going to rule over you. So the Meiji Emperor is going to realize the best way to end Western influence is to modernize. So rather than try to work along with them and have them just capture us, let's join them. Let's try to modernize just as fast as the West is. Maybe they'll leave us alone. And that is how Japan becomes the most technologically innovative place in the world. In 2019, like when you think Japan, you think video games, you think computers, you think technology. This is where it starts, the Meiji Restoration. So during this restoration, Japan's going to send these different diplomats all across Europe and America to just to study and practice the Western ways and then adapt them to their own country. So they'll get all these different ideas about how to westernize, bring it back to Japan and say, this is what we need to fix. So Japan, for one, when they visited Germany, they, the people really admired Germany's government and they really used it as a model to try to create this new constitution and new parliament. So a lot of different ideas of how Japanese government set up, they got from Germany of all places. Japanese leaders also really eagerly supported industrialization, all that stuff with the Industrial Revolution. And they're going to start building their own modern factories. They're also going to start building railroads, steamships, still bridges, all the same things that you started to see in Western Europe. And this is how Japan's going to get to the exact same level as Europe. Uh, Japan's also going to build this modern military because they're going to start modeling their army again, of all people, after the Germans. And they're also going to get their navy, which they'll get very similar to the British. So it's a weird combination between German and British ideals, um, which is going to be very strange once we get to World War II. So the Japanese are also going to start reforming education. They start taking off different models of how education systems work, both in Germany, France, and in the U.S. for their public schools. They also started to get a lot more Western fashions, different sense of style is going to be very big in Japan, and they're going to start to really model after that European sense of style in the late 1800s. Okay, so from the Meiji era, you're going to have this big sense of modernization that's really transformed Japan from this into the most industrial and militarized state that you've seen of anyone we've really talked about. So by 1900, Japan's going to have about 7,000 miles of railroad track. It's going to have thousands of factories. Their tea industry is going to be big, silk, their shipbuilding industry, and they're going to have a huge modern army and navy. So they're doing really well as the rest of Europe, but they did this way faster. You've got to think, they were 200 years behind the rest of the world, and they're going to catch up in about 50 years or so. So you don't want to mess with the Japanese. Like, they have got this together. Um, and those Meiji reforms, since they were so quick, so efficient, it's going to really gain a lot of power and respect for Japan. And you're going to have a strong sense of this Japanese nationalism, a real pride of being Japanese. And that's going to lead, lead to the end of this Western extraterritorial rights and these unequal trade treaties. So unlike in the rest of Asia, Japan became so advanced so fast, they gained so much respect that they aren't going to be conquered as easily or as quickly as the Chinese. And in the end, the Europeans are just going to leave. They're going to say, well, they're at the same level as we are. There's not much to conquer. They're too smart for us. And they aren't able to do it. So... By the 1890s, Japan's going to start to really see itself as this modern nation, and they're going to want their own form of raw materials. So just like all those other industrialized nations, Japan actually themselves is going to start to imperialize Asia. So they're going to be doing just exactly what the Western Europeans were doing. So what Japan's going to do, they're going to really look to Korea. Um, they're going to say, you know what, that's our next door neighbor. We're going to try to take them over and get their raw materials. Uh, but the problem was, 
Korea, if you guys look at it ge geographically, is right next to China. And China at the time always had a strong claim to Korea. So this dispute with China between Japan and China over claims for Korea is going to result in these Sino-Japanese Wars, which are going to last from about 1894 to 1895. So a very short time of just fighting between Japan and China over Korea. And in that short time, the Japan, the Japan defeated the Chinese army and it's going to really destroy their navy. So Japan's going to win because, again, they are so strong. They've industrialized so quickly and so efficiently. Um, and they're going to end up taking over Korea. So for their victory, Japan's going to gain also Taiwan, and they're going to have this huge influence over China. So even though Japan's this tiny little island, it's going to end up pretty much being in control of not only Korea and Taiwan, but a large portion of China as well. And China's going to be kind of afraid of Japan. So after Japan's victory over China, you're going to have a huge rivalry not only develop between Japan and China, but also between Japan and Russia. And from 1904 to 1905, Japan's going to go to war with Russia in these Russo-Japanese wars over control of both Port Arthur and Manchuria. And during this war, Japan's going to really shock the world by de defeating this huge Western power. They are going to defeat Russia. Like, again, look at the island of Japan. Japan is not that big, y'all. And it's going to end up taking over and beating Russia in a war. Um, and that's going to kind of scare the U.S. And in 1905... U.S. President at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, is going to develop this treaty for that Korea and Japan to remove Russia from Manchuria. So they're going to start to support Japan and say, you know what, we don't want to mess with you. You, you defeated Russia. You can come defeat us, too. We're going to be on your side. And so for a while, the U.S. and Japan are going to get along pretty well, uh, just because the U.S. honestly is afraid of Japan, which I think is funny because you look at how small Japan is. So a lot of the Japanese victories over China and Russia is going to, again, continue to form, transforming Japan into this dominant force in Asia. And these Western nations are going to really rely on Japan to keep order in Asia. Um, unfortunately, Japanese imperialism is going to surge yet again in the 1930s and 40s, and that's going to really be what leads into World War II, because Japan is going to start wanting to take over. Since they're so powerful, they say, you know what, why not? And so they start taking over all these tiny little islands all throughout the Pacific. And that, that conquering and that force, the way they do it so brutally, is going to really be what puts them in the spotlight for the Pacific side of World War II. Alright guys, and that's all I've got on Japan. Uh, next time we're going to talk about the imperialism as a result of the United States. See you guys next time. Bye!